Get right to the breaking news on what to expect during tomorrow's closing arguments in Donald Trump's hush money trial. Sources revealing some of the key points that both sides plan to make. CNN's Kara Scannell is in New York with the details. Kara, what are you learning? Well, Boris, in closing arguments tomorrow, Michael Cohen is expected to be a focus of both the prosecution and the defense. Sources say that Trump's attorneys are going to look to try to undermine his testimony and focus on some of the witnesses that prosecutors did not call to buttress Cohen's testimony, including the former uh, Trump Organization CFO Alan Weisselberg and Trump's former bodyguard Keith Schiller. Now, prosecutors, they are expected to argue to the jury that they don't have to rely alone on Michael Cohen and try to look towards some of these other witnesses' testimony as as well as the text messages and phone logs to bolster Cohen's credibility. Donald Trump watching NASCAR in North Carolina this weekend while his hush money trial approaches the final lap in New York. Are you going to win North Carolina? I do believe so. I think by a lot. Trump's lawyers and prosecutors will square off, trying to win over the jury of seven men and five women. Prosecutors called 20 witnesses over five weeks, and in their closing arguments, they're expected to tie testimony together with a paper trail of text messages, phone calls, and the records at the center of the case. The 11 invoices seeking payment pursuant to a retainer agreement, a dozen vouchers, and 11 checks, most signed by Trump. Mr. Trump, how are you feel going into the closing? Very good. I think uh, we have a, a great case was put on. There is no crime. During the trial, the jury heard from former members of Trump's inner circle, the publisher of the National Enquirer, David Pecker, campaign aide Hope Hicks, and his former fixer and personal attorney, Michael Cohen, who was the only witness to directly tie Trump to the cover-up. Trump's attorneys are up first in closings and are expected to attack Cohen's credibility, arguing to the jury that they cannot find Trump guilty based on the testimony of a convicted liar. Michael Cohen is a convicted liar, and he's got no credibility whatsoever. Cohen was on the witness stand for five days, telling the jury Trump called adult film actress Stormy Daniels' story a disaster for his campaign and directed Cohen to take care of it. Cohen testifying he spoke with Trump twice to get his approval just before wiring the $130,000 payment to Daniel's attorney to block her story of an alleged affair with Trump from becoming public to influence the 2016 election. Trump denies the affair. And I, I can't even tell you how many times he said to me, you know, um, I hate the fact that we did it. And my comment to him was, but every person that you've spoken to told you it was the right move. He told the jury that Trump signed off on the repayment scheme in a meeting at Trump Tower with former Trump Organization CFO Alan Weisselberg. Cohen walked the jury through the 34 allegedly falsified documents, testifying there was no retainer agreement. The money was payback for the Daniels deal. This $35,000 check was one of 11 check installments that was paid throughout the year while he was president. The president of the United States thus wrote a personal check for the payment of hush money as part of a criminal scheme to violate campaign finance laws. Trump attorney Todd Blanche has used Cohen's own words to bolster their defense, that Cohen would say anything to take Trump down and is out for revenge. I truly f***ing hope that this man ends up in prison. Now, Boris, there are already people lining up outside in the rain trying to get a seat inside the courtroom or in the overflume to hear closing arguments tomorrow. They are expected to go all day, and the judge has said that he will instruct the jury on the law on Wednesday, help them determine what the prosecution needs to prove for them to return a guilty verdict in the case. Um, once the judge does that, deliberations will get underway, and they'll continue until this jury reaches a verdict. Boris? Kara Scannell, thanks so much for the update. Let's dig deeper into the final phase of the Trump trial with former U.S. District Court Judge Shira Shinlin. Judge, thank you so much for being with us. As Kara just reported, the defense is expected to focus on, credence, uh, on Cohen's credibility. Prosecutors are going to try to corroborate his account with text messages, phone logs, and, and the testimony of other witnesses. I'm wondering what you make of these strategies. Well, both strategies are right. Prosecution can say to the jury that the witnesses are credible, but in case you have any doubt about that, look at the documents because the documents tell the story here. And there are some very damning documents. 
where Trump used the phrase reimbursement twice in documents himself, once in a Twitter, once in a disclosure that he has to make to the government uh, of funds paid. And both times he called it a reimbursement. So you don't, you don't reimburse legal fees. So there's a lot of proof that he knew that there was no retainer and that he was reimbursing uh, Cohen for making these hush money payments. So that I think the prosecution is going to stress the documents. Sure, they're going to say the witnesses corroborate each other. You should believe Cohen. You can believe Pecker. You can believe Daniels. But if you have any doubt, look at the documents. That's their strategy. Now, on the other side, the defense side, they're going to say, where is Alan Weisselberg? The, the people have the burden of proof. I have no burden of proof. The people have the burden of proof. And, and the prosecutor didn't call that witness. It's a missing witness. And Weisselberg was the third man in the room at this alleged meeting. It wasn't just Cohen and Trump. It was Weisselberg. He would have a, he would have a lot to say if he would say it. So I think they're going to pound on the failure of proof and say the people have failed to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. They're also, of course, going to attack Cohen's credibility. That's easy to do, and they're going to do it. And, Judge, what about the fact that the jury's been away from the courtroom for a week? Uh, what kind of impact could that have? Well, that's not so great for, for the defense because the last witness in the case was Costello. And so what are they going to remember for five days was this strange witness who was antagonizing the judge. Clearly, they knew that. The jury was aware of that. The jury was sent out. The courtroom was cleared. They knew that, that, that the two weren't getting along. They also knew that about 15 objections were sustained in a row. And, and jurors bond with the judge. So it's not good that for five days, the last thing on their mind was Costello. But we'll see, because... After the summations comes the charge, and that's really the last thing juries, jurors remember, is what did the judge tell them to do in the jury room? Speaking of what happens in the jury room, um, what are deliberations typically like in a, in a case as divisive as this one? Well, that's hard to say. I don't sit in the jury room. When, when I spent so many years as a judge, I sat on the bench. But I made a practice to talk to the jury after every verdict that I had. I would go into the jury room, I would shake the hands of every juror, and I would ask them uh, about their reactions to the trial. And they would often say, uh, you know, the prosecutor was very good, he, was, he or she was very clear, the documents told the story, or they would say they didn't like a certain lawyer, too aggressive, too wandering. They would always give me their reactions to the sort of performance of the lawyer. But... It, over time, they would also come together. They would say, you know, our first vote was like six to six. But after a couple days, people became convinced and it became 12 to zero because they try not to hang. If, they, if, they're, if there's a sense there's going to be a hung jury, the judge will give what's called an Allen charge mm. and will tell the jury, you know, try harder because no jury is going to be any better than you are. You've sat here, you've listened, you've paid attention. So go back and try harder. And they may reach a verdict because one of the fears here is that it would be a hung jury. Judge Shira Shinlin, great to hear your perspective. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Of course. Let's expand the conversation now with former Trump attorney Tim Parlatori, along with former federal prosecutor Elise Adamson. Uh, Tim, the defense goes first, so we'll go first to you. Uh, I saw you nodding when Judge Shinlin brought up the testimony, or lack thereof, right. of Alan Weisselberg, the Trump Organization CFO, why is he a pivotal part of the defense and their closing argument? He is pivotal because everything in this case hinges upon that meeting at Trump Tower. You know, all, all, everything else that the prosecution has put forth about Karen McDougal and catch and kill and all that stuff, it's all interesting atmospherics, but the difference between a legal transaction and an illegal transaction for Donald Trump is what happened in that meeting, who was there, what was said, did he know? And so the only three people that can testify about that are... Donald Trump, Alan Weisselberg, and Michael Cohen. There's corroboration of everything else Cohen said, but nothing on that meeting. So it really, it comes down to that meeting. If they don't call Weisselberg, that's something that, as a defense, I would pound on that. Because there were two witnesses they could have called. They only called one. They didn't call the other person. And you, should, you can assume the reason they didn't call him was because he wasn't going to help their case. Elise, how do you see that argument from the defense? As a, as a prosecutor, if you're going in, 
and you have to justify not calling Alan Weisselberg, how do you fold that into your closing argument? Yeah, and I'm sure the prosecution is anticipating that argument, and they knew by not calling Weisselberg they were opening themselves up to that. I think um, how you handle it is by focusing on the evidence. Instead of getting too defensive, you just argue why it doesn't matter, and that's because you have corroboration. Yes, there were only three people in the room. One of them did testify, and that's Michael Cohen. Now, we understand he has severe credibility problems, but everything else he said has been corroborated by the documentary evidence. And jurors are allowed to make inferences, permissible inferences, on circumstantial evidence. What the, that's what the documents are. So I think by focusing on that, refocusing the jury on everything we do have and how everything we have makes sense and fits into Michael Cohen's account, they can take a little of the sting out of that line of argument.